Welcome to Veteran Resource Podcast, where you will meet nonprofit organizations focused on improving the lives of veterans and their family members. Here is your host, Jeremy Paris. Welcome, everybody, to episode 32 of the Veteran Resource Podcast. I'm your host, Jeremy Paris, and today's guest is Denny Meyer with American Veterans for Equal Rights. A friend of mine reached out to me and said, Jeremy, I've been listening to the episodes and great stuff you have there, but I'm curious, are you going to have any LGBT organizations on there? And I have to admit, I had no idea that there were any LGBT veteran organizations out there. And so we started a conversation and he was able to put me in touch with Denny Meyer from American Veterans for Equal Rights or AVER as they're called. And that conversation led to this interview. Born to Holocaust refugees at the close of World War II when Truman was president, Denny began a lifetime of activism at the age of 13 when he joined the NAACP picket line. Since then, he has battled for gay rights, women's rights, transgender rights, and LGBT veterans' rights. During the Vietnam era, he left college and volunteered to serve his country, joining the Navy, either for the love of the sea or for the dress blue bell-bottom 13-button uniform. Not sure. In less than four years, he was a petty officer second class. Later, he worked for the Army Reserves as a civilian administrator and, after joining his reserve unit, rose to sergeant first class. After AIDS took the life of his love of 20 years, then he became inspired to found the New York chapter of Aver called Averni. He served as Region 1 Vice President for a number of years and currently serves as both the Aver National Public Affairs Officer and Vice President of Veterans Affairs. All right, let's jump right into the interview. Denny, welcome to the Veteran Resource Podcast. How are you doing today? It's a pleasure to be here. Excellent. Nice to, nice to be able to talk to you guys and tell you about our group. Great. Well, let's get started with a brief description of the organization. American Veterans for Equal Rights is the nation's lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender veteran service organization. And we were founded in 1990. At that time, there were roughly 42 independent LGBT veterans, veterans groups around the country. And it was decided it was about time to form a federation. And there was a big meeting in Washington, D.C. of all 42 groups with people who hated each other's guts glaring at each other. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, because there were a lot of big egos and stuff like that and people who'd been running their own organizations for the longest time. And so about half of them walked out, and the people who were very serious about forming a national movement got together. And there were about 24 chapters. And it's, it's give or take, over time, there are 20 to 24 chapters around the country in, in cities across America. And it was originally, of course, in 1990, to support those people who are LGBT veterans and who are who were not appreciated anywhere at that time. And then uh, when Don't Ask, Don't Tell came into being, the organization had a, a real purpose, which was to battle that very unfair procedure, program, and policy to uh, work towards ending Don't Ask, Don't Tell and to be a place where lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender veterans could be proud of their service and proud of who they are at the same time. And those have been our two purposes all along. We advocate for our rights and for our benefits, and we've been very successful lately in the last few years, and uh, provide pride and community for our members and I'm the National Veterans Service, of, uh, uh, sorry, National Veterans Affairs Officer as well. And we provide a place where they can call and get advice uh, regarding their benefits and their rights, talking to a fellow gay service member so they get to talk to Sergeant Denny. That's who I am. So 
Gotcha. I could go on about uh, <laughs> all the different programs that we do. Well, uh, actually, it's, Denny, it's, we're, we're going to get into the organization a whole lot more in just a second. Uh, before yeah. we do, though, I kind of wanted to dig in a little bit and find out more about you. Can you uh, kind of well, go a little bit over your bio there? Yeah. Uh, well, my parents were refugees from World War II, from the Holocaust. They came to America. My mother was an illegal immigrant, and uh, she's the one who taught me American patriotism. She taught me that there's nothing more precious than American freedom. And so I don't know that she uh, realized that would make me <laughs> volunteer to serve, but that's what happened. <laughs> uh, I was born in the mid-1940s to becoming the first baby boomer, uh, conceived in celebration of the end of World War II. And so fast forward to 1968, I was in college. The anti-Vietnam War protests were raging across the college campuses of America. And my fellow students who took their American freedom for granted burned the American flag. And as a first-generation American, that pushed my button. And I said, it's time to pay my country back for my family's freedom. And I went out and volunteered. <laughs> and uh, my gay friends said to me, you can't do that. You're a little <laughs> faggot. <laughs> and I said, watch me. And 10 years later, I was a sergeant first class, actually eight years later, and served for 10 years. <laughs> so... It's just a matter of putting your mind to doing what you want. So I served in the Navy for about four years on an aircraft carrier and in uh, NATO headquarters in the U.S. And then uh, left after my first tour and decided I wanted to be free as a gay person and went looking for work. And it took me a while to realize I had one thing to sell, which is military administration. And so I got a federal job with the Department of the Army, administering Army Reserve units. And uh, as soon as I took that job, some genius in Washington said, you know, if we ever activated the reserves, these civilian administrators wouldn't go along. Better require them to be a member of the unit they administer. And so then I was in the Army. <laughs> <laughs> so interesting anyway yeah so all together 10 year service okay and uh, and uh why did you why did you get involved with uh aver well uh this was about 2003 by that time i was totally disabled had had a couple of heart attacks and had uh, spinal degeneration which was resulting from jumping out of helicopters during Vietnam. You've heard of Huey jumping, right? <laughs> <laughs> I've heard of it. <laughs> it's, a lot, it's, a lot of, it's a lot of fun when you're 20 years old. A helicopter hovers about 15 feet up, and you jump, and you land on your boots with 60 pounds of gear, and you feel really, really manly, and now 45 years later, I have spinal degeneration. They don't jump anymore, by the way. They rappel down because of guys like me. Hmm. So anyway, I uh, I needed to get into the VA, and I was having a bit of trouble getting signed up. And I'd heard that there was a gay veterans group, and I decided to call them for help. Couldn't find them. Started Googling around and found a chapter in Washington, D.C. So I called there, and a, retire a gay retired Marine colonel answered the phone. And I said, where's the New York chapter? He said, there isn't one. You started. <laughs> <laughs> I've been out of the service too long and forgot that you don't volunteer to do anything, particularly to a colonel. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it all started. And so you did and at that point. You jumped right into it? I did. I was ready to do that because I wasn't working anymore. And I, I've been an activist all my life. My first march was with CORE, Congress of Racial Equality, at the age of 13 in 1960. That's a year before the president was born. 
So I've been an activist for 55 years. Wow. So, you know, for gay, uh, uh, black civil rights, women's rights, gay rights, transgender rights, you know, and immigrants' rights. My mother is an immigrant after all. And so I basically, you know, when you become disabled and you stop working, you know, you go through all kinds of head trips. And suddenly I realized I had a purpose. And I've been at this now for about 15 years. Oh, wow. So, wow. Yep. And uh, American uh, Veterans for Equal Rights is the oldest and largest chapter-based all-volunteer national LGBT veteran service organization in the United States. I hope I got that right. Um, well, yeah. And, you know, there's a couple of caveats there. Uh, we're the oldest national organization. Uh, the oldest, you know, I said there were originally 42 independent groups. The oldest one was formed in the late 80s in, in, in San Francisco. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. But that was an independent one, just local. So, <laughs> but we've been around for, you know, since 1990. That's others that's actually when I went into the military, by the way. Uh-huh. So others have come and gone. Um, we're pretty steady. And okay, so over that time, a, a, a lot has changed in the military as far as LGBT rights over the years. Uh, are there still some policy changes that, that are still needed? Well, the original bill to repeal Don't Ask, Don't Tell, introduced by Congressman Marty Meehan of Massachusetts in 2005, had a lot of sections, a lot of provisions to cover everything, all of which went out the window. Well, the whole plan failed, and there was a compromise bill put together in the last few months in 2010, and all those provisions were thrown out. It was just a bare-bones repeal. And therefore, we spent the last few years, ever since then, uh, overcoming all of that stuff. Hmm. So, for example, our marriages were not recognized. But the two Supreme Court decisions of the last few years, including this past summer, finally took care of all that so that gay married veterans can get benefits, including spousal benefits and benefits for their children and so on. Everything that normal people get with normal marriages, which is what we have. You know, there were issues about on-base housing, all kinds of things. And the Pentagon leadership that started repealing Don't Ask, Don't Tell in 2010 really had a good plan. It was put together by Jay Johnson, who's now the Secretary of Homeland Security. Um, and it was all a matter of leadership from the top down, expecting um, the new policy to be followed through down the chain of command. And that's been done, but there's been some resistance down the chain of command where people think leadership in the Pentagon doesn't know as much as they do. <laughs> hmm. And so there been, there's been some resistance. Look, the last federal agency to recognize same-sex marriage was the Veterans Administration. Even though all federal agencies were doing that two years ago, um, the VA lawyers said, no, 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 no. There's this obscure regulation which actually wasn't ruled on and so on and so forth. And it was only a few days ago, on October 15th, that the VA finally joined the rest of the federal government in recognizing all same-sex marriages in every state. Wow, that just happened. Yes. And, uh, you know, the, the edict that the VA put out, of course, was written in dense legalese by lawyers with lexicographical disease. <laughs> 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 but um, basically, the money should start flowing. All the claims by veterans and states that did, had not recognized our marriages were put on hold, quote, while we review our policy. Hmm. That, took, that took four months. I had thought it would take years. I thought that children with two daddies would have to grow up before they could be recognized as other than bastards by the VA, but it only took four months. So... Hmm. Theoretically, the money should start flowing soon. Um, look, there's another thing, which is the 100,000-plus people who were discharged less than honorably due to homosexuality 
from World War II to the present. What's the rule? 2011, anyway. And that provision of giving discharge upgrades for that was also stripped away from the original bill. And there's a bill in Congress today called the Restore Honor to Service Members Act, which would streamline and automate the process for those discharged purely for being gay. Nowadays, without that, it can take 18 years to get a discharge upgrade by wending your way through the VA and military bureaucracy and boards and this and that and with conflicting roles and everything else. Uh, it's a nightmare and most people don't bother. So wow. now this bill would, if it were passed, streamline and automate the process. Of course, there's a political party in this country that doesn't want to approve anything. <laughs> <laughs> so there you have it. And so your organization, um, Aver, are they are they going in, in trying to push for policy or um, what kind we, of programs do you have? Well, we, we, we do it, uh, several different things. One of the things is we advocate for LGBT rights legislation, particularly that affecting service members and veterans. Okay. So that's why I'm advocating that bill, for example. Um, we're a nonprofit, 501c3, so we do not do political campaigning. We cannot endorse candidates, but we can endorse legislation that it, you know affects our rights and benefits. So that's one of the things we do. Gotcha. As I said, we provide community and pride so that uh, our chapters actually meet generally on a monthly basis around the country, and there you can go and be proud of who you are as well as be proud of your service because, you know, there's kind of a conflict there. You know, if, if you're a veteran and you go tell your gay friends that you're a, by the way, I'm a veteran, they'll go, oh, how could you do that? You know, because it's not really a gay thing to do, or so they think. And then if you go to your veteran friends and tell a straight veteran, oh, by the way, I'm gay. It's like, holy. You know? <laughs> so here you can be proud of both your sides at once. So and, there, there is a we speaking. Are, we, are, we are patriots. You know, I don't even let anybody join my chapter unless they're patriotic. <laughs> and, and there was a uh, actual figure that you gave me that kind of blew me away when we had uh, spoken the first time on the phone and uh, it was the amount of homosexual veterans that were out there. There are roughly one million living LGBT veterans who've served from World War II to the present. That's one not million counting the ones who've died. Living. So there's probably the living. So there's probably two million people, at least, if not more, that have served from World War II to the present. There was an estimate during the war in Iraq and Afghanistan that at any one time there's roughly 79,000 LGBT veterans on active duty at any one time. Wow. So, and that's why that, that struck me as funny when you were saying, you know, that, that people would say, you know, you're gay, you can't be a veteran and, and vice versa. Uh, because, yeah, a million, that's yeah. quite a number. Well, here's another number for you because it, it's 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 something people don't know, and that is transgender Americans are twice as likely as any other group to volunteer to serve their country. Hmm. You'd think that there weren't. There's probably at least a hundred thousand transgender veterans around at this point, and that they still can't serve. Oh, by the way, yeah, uh, that's that's you know the last frontier basically is they still can't serve openly. They're still being investigated and kicked out. Now, the promise is that'll change in January. The Pentagon is working on that. But, you know, we'll believe it when we see it. But the uh, Secretary of Defense, uh, Ashton Carter, has said that the policy will change in January and transgender people will be able to serve openly. Now, you might think that's radical, but America is the last of our allied countries that'll still doesn't allow that. All of our allied countries allowed 
LGBT, including transgender, serve openly since the mid-90s. And they have had no problems whatsoever. Hmm. That includes the British, Canada, Australia, Israel, you name it. Well, it sounds like we're, we're getting closer. Yes. Not, not quite there yet. Mm-hmm. And uh, you mentioned that this was a chapter-based organization. Uh, how many chapters did you say there are? Uh, you know what? I, it's, it's escaped me at the moment, but I'm guessing roughly 20. Okay. So you don't yet have a chapter in every state. No. Um, and but so- we're, getting, we're constantly getting inquiries from people who are calling us for assistance and advice in different parts of the country where you can smell the land as I like to say, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, they're eager enough to start, cha- you know, consider starting chapters. Do so you- we've got people in, I think it's Nebraska and, 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 and oh, several different states that are just beginning to look into starting up a chapter. Oh, so that, that's an ongoing process. And do you hit them up kind of like your colonel did? When they call and ask if, if well, there's a chapter. <laughs> you know, I wasn't a colonel. I was a sergeant first class. So I, <laughs> I try to, you know, be a little bit more gentle about it. <laughs> you know, I, I try to convince people rather than order them around. You know? <laughs> but and, but it is, uh, it is possible for these people to go ahead and start their own though, right? I'm sorry? I'm sorry, um, but it is possible for these, if, if there isn't a chapter nearby, that somebody could go ahead and start their own chapter. Well, we're working with us, yes. They can't just, just on do their it own, on their right. own. You know, they have to apply. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we do that all the time. And uh, what is the best way for them to, to start that process? Okay. So they can go to the AVER website, first of all, which is aver.us www.aver.us and have a look through that and see what it's all about. And then they can call the National Public Affairs Officer. That's me. My phone number is right on there. And I can get them started, give them some advice and hear what they want to do, and then connect them up to their regional vice president. We have five regions. Okay. Who will help them in their local region to get a chapter started. It's not really complicated. You just have to have the will to kind of, you know, be organizational and do a lot of work to get things started. And yeah. once you're done, have somebody who never lifted a finger tell you you did it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this is the nature of volunteer work, you know. <laughs> well, well, these people have been in the military, so I'm sure they'll be used to that. Yeah. Look, you know, one of the main things we do for Pride is march in parades. And so we march in, of course, pride parades around the country in June. And on November 11th, you know, coming up in a week or so, we march in Veterans Day parades around the country, generally as the only gay group. In the Veterans Day parade, we carry the American flag and the rainbow flag. And we're the only group in the Veterans Day parades with a rainbow flag. Hmm. The pride parades... We're the only group with an American flag, usually. So, <laughs> you know, everybody's got a rainbow flag. <laughs> so you do your best to stand out in both situations. Well, because we're proud <laughs> to be Americans. You know, that's what it's all about. Absolutely. We don't go marching down the street half naked. You know, we we want to be <laughs> dignified veterans. You know, and and generally we try to get people to wear their uniforms and wear their medals, because most people have a chest full of medals. You know, we have a lot of Vietnam veterans and a lot of more recent ones from Afghanistan and Iraq. I know a transgender woman who's a member member who served for 37 years and has 30, 30 combat medals. Wow. Starting with the Vietnam Cross of Valor and two Purple Hearts and everything else in between. So Wow, that's impressive. (laughs) <laughs> she she gives speeches all the time. She's in her mid seventies, I think. And she was giving a speech in Chicago in Delhi Square at a big event. And some and, and you know, as a known transgender veteran, and some admiral leaned over to a general and said, "God damn, she's got more medals than I do." <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so there we are. We've got a lot of people who served entire careers in the military, 20 plus years. Our current president, Steve, Lieutenant Colonel Steve Loomis, served a full 20 years, was a platoon leader in Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I just interviewed a guy, a woman, who was for 20 years an, a male Air Force fighter pilot flying our most advanced fighter planes over Persian Gulf and over Iraq. And uh, after that entire career, then transitioned and became a woman. And being a fighter pilot is the kind of person who has the right stuff. You can't just become a fighter pilot. Right. You've got to be able to fly upside down at nine Gs and remain perfectly calm. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, of course, have four advanced degrees in aeronautical engineering, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's like being an astronaut. Mm. And so the point is, being gay, being transgender, has nothing to do with the ability to serve your country. Absolutely. In fact, there appears to be some correlation between aptitude for cryptology and being a linguist and being gay. Because DLI, the Defense Language Institute, of course, was notoriously crawling with gay people. And during the height of the witch hunts, the overzealous folks hunting for gay people constantly, repeatedly raided DLI, taking out entire classes of gay people to the point where there was a shortage of Arab linguists in our armed forces. Hmm. And because they didn't, they discharged gay people whom they didn't trust to be linguists, they hired foreign national native speakers, Syrians. <laughs> wow. And other people who turned out to be not quite as loyal as gay people. They all turned out to be double agents and spies and stuff like that. Good idea. <laughs> Meanwhile, all the gay folks with security clearances and DLI training in Arabic, they actually got letters when they were discharged. Please come to DOD and apply for a job as a civilian contractor. And some of them were sent right back to Iraq to the same unit that they'd been serving in, but this time as a civilian contractor embedded with their unit, doing the same thing, intercepting enemy transmissions, giving warnings about ambushes and so on, but at 10 times the pay. <laughs> <laughs> and with the privilege of saying, you know, I'm tired of this, I'm going home now, because they were civilians. <laughs> right, right. So, <laughs> <laughs> It's, so, uh, so Denny, for the LGBT veterans out there that are listening and, and they want to get involved with AVER, uh, what is the best way for them to do that? Well, okay. So, again, you go to the AVER website. That's always the starting point. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, AVER.us, and you can click join, for example. Um, and there's, you know, there's ways to communicate with us by email, uh, et cetera. And, and my phone number is there as well if they want to really talk about how involved they want to get. And if they have questions, I'm the public affairs officer, but I'm also the veterans affairs officer. Not a day passes that I don't hear from people with issues. How do I do this? How do I do that? Am I entitled to my benefits? Even though I'm gay, if I go to the VA, will I be kicked out if they think I'm gay? <laughs> no. And so this is what I, you know, I answer their questions. Hmm. And if they're looking for legal help, we don't have that, but we have law firms that have volunteered uh, to provide that, and I can refer them. Oh, great. Almost any issue. I'm also, as it happens, the public affairs officer and the veterans affairs officer for transgender veterans of America. <laughs> mm. A separate group. You wear many hats. Trans I'm sorry, transgender American veterans. Well, it's the same hat, really. <laughs> so I've been doing that for a decade for them as well. And there are separate issues there. People want to get their DD-214 changed to change their name and gender, which is now possible. And so we have all this, you know, endless advice for folks of how to do things. And basically, you know, if you have a veterans issue, you could go to a VSO at American Legion or um, BFW or what have you. 
But gay people have been discriminated against so much, they don't feel comfortable to doing that. They want to talk to a gay veteran service organization. And so they get to talk to old Sergeant Denny. That's, <laughs> and I have the same advice. But they feel safer. And I'm very happy to provide it. So Great, great. Denny, is, uh, are there members in Averd that are not LGBT? Yes. Anybody who's, anybody can join, actually. Okay. I'm going to C3. And so you be, are you a voting member if you are a veteran. Gotcha. A non-voting member if you're not a veteran. But um, anybody with skills to contribute and so on is welcome to join. We don't call them anything but members. We don't have associate members or anything like that. You're a member. And people contribute their skills and get involved because they want to. So, you know, it's not a place to pick up a veteran. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we do get people who have that fantasy, you know. <laughs> you know, I tell them, go hang out outside of base. Leave me alone. You know? <laughs> I mean, it's not for that. You know, it really isn't. Right. But most people are mature and intelligent gay adults nowadays, and uh, they want to help those who've served this country. And so there's plenty to do, believe me, because there's people with PTSD, with gay PTSD, from suffering every day of their service under the threat of being murdered if they get found out, or being interrogated for months and dishonorably discharged in disgrace. Hmm. It gives you PTSD. I served for 10 years, and all time, all that time, every single day, I heard homophobic jokes and threats because they didn't know I was sitting right there with them. They thought I was just like them, a straight imbecile. <laughs> okay, <laughs> And they would tell crude jokes and say, oh, if I ever found one of those guys, I'd kick his teeth in. And I'm sitting right there, of course, but they don't know that you know they're talking to me. And if there's a joke, you can't just be silent. You have to laugh crudely along with them in those days so they think you were one of them instead of one of us. And uh, that gives you PTSD after a while. Mm. So that's the story. Uh, I put up with that for a decade. And part of my reason that I'm doing this work now is fighting back against all that that I had to suffer and go through. So, Well, I'm, I'm happy to see that times have have changed they're still in a in a evolving state right now as as we mentioned earlier and you know things aren't the way they were back during world war ii times they're not even the way that they were during the time that i went in but i, I feel that they're still evolving well you know about five or six years ago i was at a gay pride rally in the heart of new york city in bryant park and uh, it was right next to a major avenue where there was a street fair, a regular street fair. And I'm standing kind of in the entrance to this thing, handing out the literature for Aber, wearing my veteran's garrison cap with my Sergeant First Class insignia on it. And an elderly couple wandered into the park, seeing all the colorful flags and not knowing what the hell that was all about. They were tourists. Hmm. The guest guy was 88 years old, and he had his arm around his wife, and he was wearing a World War II vet baseball cap. And, of course, he came right over to me because he saw my veteran's hat. And he says, you're a veteran? I said, yes. And he says, what is this? What's going on here? I said, well, this is a gay pride rally. Oh. And I expected to hear some shit. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. And he looks at me and he looks around at the rainbow flags and everything. He says, so you're a gay veteran? I said, that's right. And I expected to hear some shit. And he says, well, I'll tell you what, he says, I was in the Normandy invasion, and five members of our unit were gay. And I want you to know the German bullets didn't discriminate. Mm. We covered each other's asses. I wanted to burst into tears. Here's an 88-year-old man saying supportive saying things instead of telling me to go through myself. <laughs> so, yes, times are changing, even for people who served back then. Right. So... Denny, is there, is there anything else that you wanted to say before we jump into the final three questions? Uh, listen, I could go on for six hours. So. <laughs> <laughs> Better go right ahead. Great, great. Okay, question number one. Who would you like to hear on a future episode of the Veteran Resource Podcast? 
Oh, well, my suggestion would be the president of transgender American veterans, because there's a whole separate story there. And uh, the current president is uh, named Evan Young, who served as a female and transitioned to male. So she's a trans man. And she served a full 20 years as a major in the Army. So that would be a suggestion. Excellent. Excellent. Okay, question number two. What project has you fired up right now? Well, I talked about that. The Restore Honor to Service Members Act. I would really like to see that pass. And we're actually looking for people who were less than honorably discharged and still haven't had that rectified and could benefit from this bill would be willing to tell their story in support of that bill. So if you were less than honorably discharged for being gay and you'd like to tell your story, they can contact me. You can go to the AVRA website and look for the National Public Affairs Officer, Demi Meyer, and click on it. They can email me. And I'll call them up. And uh, we'll just talk about telling your story. So that's what I'm fired up about now, because as National Veterans Affairs Officer, that's one of the major inquiries that I'm constantly getting. How do I get a discharge upgrade? The answer is there isn't a hell of a lot you can do until this bill is passed. So that's what got, has me fired up at the moment. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. The last question. This is the brain stretcher. Uh-huh. If you woke up tomorrow and you found out that somebody made an anonymous donation of $10 million to your organization, what would you do with it? Well, we've thought about that, and uh, we don't need quite that much, but we would start becoming an official VSO, Veteran Service Organization. That is to say, we'd have the money, like American Legion and VFW, to set up offices with paid staff to provide full veteran services for LGBT veterans and and any other veteran who comes in with uh, people getting the VSO training from the VA and getting certified to represent veterans to the VA and put in their claims for them and so on, where you don't have to be embarrassed to mention, oh, I'm gay, because the people you're working with will be gay. And you can claim PTSD from having suffering discrimination and things like that. So we'd set up a full service paid staff organization. And believe me, that's really expensive to do. We looked into it. (laughs) I can (laughs) imagine. Yeah. So that's what we would do with the money. And if we had 10 million, that would be surplus. We could provide counseling services, housing. Uh, I, for one, would like to see... (laughs) Gay senior housing for senior citizen veterans who are gay and lesbian. Hmm. I'm ready for that. I'm 69 years old. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, there's plenty of things that can be done. Excellent. So for the person out there that has $10 million and you're looking for something to do with it, you just heard what Denny could do with it. So for that person with the $10 million or for anybody else out there, Denny, who wants to throw some money at you, Mm -hmm. what's the best way? Go to the Avro website, find my name, find my phone number, call me up. <laughs> <laughs> Don't waste time with an email. I want to hear about it. Um, this, is I, this is what I do full time. So, you know, this is this is what I do for a non-living. Uh, that's what all volunteer organization means. We have people all over the country doing these different jobs. Nobody's paid. We're all volunteers. And we're all dedicated to what we do. So... Well, I really appreciate uh, you coming on the show and, and sharing uh, with all of the listeners about you and about the organization. I thank you for giving me the opportunity. And uh, hopefully some more veterans will be uh, listening to the show and they'll, they'll be giving you a call. Right. Oh, one more plug. Uh-huh. I'm also the editor of an independent webzine called GayMilitarySignal.com. And I tell the stories of LGBT service. I've interviewed members of Congress, senators, and representatives. Um, and we have a bit of news and things like that. So, and that's published roughly monthly. 
So that's GameMilitarySignal.com. So oh, people might enjoy that. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on the show, Denny. Thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. All righty. All right, that wraps up episode 32. I hope all of my LGBT friends and non-LGBT friends enjoyed the episode. And if you do happen to be an LGBT veteran, then I really invite you to give Denny a call and uh, get plugged into the organization. And if there's not a chapter in your area, he told you exactly what you need to do to, to get one started. The website was mentioned a few times during the episode, but for anybody that wants to get the information on how to get connected with Aver or with Denny, you can find all of the information on the show notes page, which is located at veteranpodcast.com slash 032. And also make sure that you go out and hit the Facebook page, facebook.com slash veteran resource podcast. And we're going to have some information coming out soon. And I think you're going to like where we're going with it. Okay, we will see you in episode 33.